my name is Kurt Scott and I will be talking today about an assessment of testing and certification requirements at each stage of the PV development. Now um, I think you will see that the, these um, requirements are different by necessity. With that, let me begin. Here is an overview of the talk that we have today. We're going to look at why we test, what and how we test, are the available tests adequate? Do they answer the questions that the testing themselves ask? And if they are not, and I think you'll find in some cases they are not, then what do we do? How to get through this model? Understanding the, the deliverables that are expected. And um, then I will end up with a look, a brief look, at some tips on how you can um, design your own test program and look at some of the best practices that are used today perhaps in other industries. And by the way, in terms of scope, we're looking at here at durability testing of materials, cells, and modules. We're not looking at the safety testing requirements. Very important, but those just don't fall under our purview. So why do we test? Well, from the material standpoint, frankly, I can't think of another material, another product, that is required to spend its entire service life in the harshest environment available. PV modules must be deployed in order to be effective in most direct sunlight that is available in any particular location where they are deployed. And the damaging UV from the, 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 the solar radiation along with the heat and humidity that accompanies a product that is left outdoors is really a very challenging environment for anything. When you combine these things to the other less thought about onslaughts like pollutants, salt water, mist and acid rain, the mechanical factors of abrasion from sun, sand and dust and hail, and these all come together in um, what you could consider an attack on the PV module and usually you see um, the initiation of degradation at the microscopic level which causes um, further property changes and in some cases lead up to premature failure of the PV module. This is all on a product that is expected to last for 25-30 years. Very, very difficult challenge indeed. So in order to establish that the modules are up to this really daunting task, they have to be tested and very thoroughly tested and testing along the entire development stage. So in a nutshell, that's why we test. Throughout the um, development of PV, and by the way, this pie chart comes courtesy of the National Renewable Energy Lab, there were three factors that were competing in the development of viable PV modules. It was recognized that the cost must be minimized. At the same time, you have to be, in order to be viable, maximizing the performance in, in terms of efficiency of the module. And as I mentioned before, durability is expected to be okay for 25 to 30 years. All of these are in competition with the other. You can make an absolutely perfect PV module, I'm sure, if you had no constraint of cost. Fact of the matter in the real world, you do. So you have to balance these three pieces of the pie. But in terms of where we are today, it is generally regarded that as far as the um, performance level, we are at an acceptable level. The efficiencies are about where people think they will be. Sure, you can spend a lot more money to, to eke out a couple more percentage points going forward, but not make any really substantial incremental leap in performance. So it is generally thought then that the money that is available for the development of PV ought to really be spent on looking at durability issues because those play a factor in cost and viability. So when we look at the testing along the development chain, we test to acquire qualification and certification marks, very definitely necessary for the commercial viability of PV. We test also for research and development purposes, as well as to do comparative testing between different designs, whether they are our own, internally developed, or whether we are doing some sort of a 
comparison testing with the competition. And as I've alluded to twice already, we test to establish reliability and durability estimates for the life of the PV. So really, when you look at these three reasons for testing, we really are testing to make the business case for PV. We're testing to see how commercially viable PV is going to be. Now, in terms of testing for um, a PV development program, according to this diagram that I'm showing here, where we show we test to predict, mitigate, and detect. And you can see the arrows between each one going in both directions. What this is suggesting is that in a PV development program, testing is really never really finished. You don't test a product and say, all right, that's fine, it's done, with, and we no longer need to test release of product. No. In some cases, we're always looking to detect any opportunities for improvement. We're testing to look to see if uh, we can mitigate any issues that our uh, preliminary tests indicate may occur. And we're also testing to predict the lifetime of, of products. These three, and uh, when you get a copy of this presentation, you can look at the details in the blue boxes, which I will not go through at this point in time, to which indicate the specific reasons for testing. But understand that testing in a PV development program really never ends. It's an ongoing proposition. I have in the box below here that for the, the commercial imperatives for PV are that safety concerns must be addressed, performance issues must be addressed, and reliability issues must be addressed. And I make the, the statement in red here that durability impacts all of the above. If you don't have a durable product, if you won't have a safe product. If the polymeric materials that you have encasing a PV module starts to fall apart because of uh, degradation due to uh, UV exposure and weathering exposure, then that product is going to probably expose some um, operators to live electricity. Obviously, the same issue can cause uh, degradation of performance and perhaps even a complete collapse of the, the product, which of course would be a failure of reliability. So let's now look at what and how we test. Now, when you stop to consider for a while, every test that you conduct really is a, a question asked. You, add, you conduct a test to ask a question. And when you look at the different stages of development of PV, it necessarily means that the questions asked of the tests are different. For example, at the materials level, you're looking to see if my materials are acceptable. Are, are they likely, based on what I know from experience with perhaps in other industries or so forth, and, and what I know about the environment in which these are going to be exposed, are these materials likely to be suitable to be um, incorporated in a PV cell or module. So you're really looking at screening and selection processes. At the cell level, you're looking more than likely at design and process that validation. You've already selected your materials and said, yeah, these appear to be good enough. But how do they work together in a package? When I put them together in the package of a cell, and I, you know, I have to do that with process and so forth, do I have a product at the end of that that is likely to be successful in a module? Now, at the module level, you're testing for qualifications, certifications, and so forth. And at the PV array level, you're looking at manufacturing and installation issues and asking the question again, do I have the performance that is necessary to uh, make this a commercially viable product? And is it likely to last 15 to 30 years? So let's look more specifically then at um, some of the types of issues we'll encounter at the different levels of development. At the materials level, where you'll be testing things like cover glass and polymeric top sheets, substrates and back sheets, protective and anti-reflective coatings and capsulins and so forth, you can, you're asking again to see if these materials are going to be suitable. You do the screening process of the available materials to you and weed out the ones that don't look like they're viable. And this kind of testing is usually done in, I would say, a conventional weathering instrument. All of the polymeric materials uh, manufacturers have instruments like the one pictured here to do exactly the type of testing that I've just talked about. Now, at the cell level, again, remember I said we're looking at design and process uh, 
questions. We'll be looking at edge effects, moisture ingress issues, looking to see if you have those, looking at corrosion issues, asking whether you have any thermal expansion coefficient difference issues, um, looking at degradations and so forth. So the questions you're asking at this level are different from what you would earlier. And those kinds of uh, tests are typically done in a weathering type of instrument that is shown here. Something that can house a cell in you know, a flat piece on a flat table and uh, where you can modify all of the, the parameters of the test and that you subject the materials to. At a PV modular uh, level, where you're looking at qualification tests, obviously you need a much bigger chamber that can house a, um, an entire module and you'll be looking at qualification issues where you're doing initial IV curve tracing, um, checking to see what your Pmax is and other uh, performance characterizations. You'll also, of course, be looking to see if there are any hotspots issues, any issues related to interconnects, uh, bus bars, and so forth. Now, at the PVRA level, again, we're looking at degradation, characterization, we're looking to see if we have any issues when we tie to the grid, and we are looking to see if there are installation issues. Now, to date, this step has only been done outdoors, but there are no more instruments coming on board now that are capable to test the entire PV module, and maybe even more than one together tied together. So let's now look at the, um, the available tests that we have in the industry now that have tested along those value chains. Since um, most of the tests that we conduct in the PV industry, we, you know, similar to uh, many other industries, are tests that have been developed by consensus standards organizations. And um, even though the standards uh, process and, uh, is, is much of my, my line, standards are indeed necessary. And standards are necessary because they, they provide a common language to um, the standards users, wherever they may be. They are critical, therefore, to establish user confidence, they are critical for trade, and they are critical to address safety protocols. Now, standards are not developed for the sake of developing standards. Usually they are developed to address some existing need. Whether those needs are safety, performance, and reliability, the group of stakeholders get together and develop um, standards that they can all use. And when they're, they use a common standard, it is known universally how it, the test is to be conducted, what the test means, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> how to communicate about the test without going through a whole long communication. If you run a UL1703 in Egypt or in Russia, you simply say that. And it is well known what was done and what it means to have passed that test. That's why standards are, are developed. Having said that, the standards landscape can be very convoluted. When you look at the testing requirements for PV materials, first of all, when you're looking at qualification issues, durability, reliability, electrical performance, safety, service life predictions, all those issues have to be addressed in standards. And you have a lot of different standards organization worldwide that sometimes are looking at the very same issues. So the standards landscape can be very, very convoluted. So to continue on, let's look at some of the standards that are typically used for testing of materials. And as I mentioned earlier in this talk, the, um, the people who develop, for example, polymeric materials, the DuPonts, the Dow Cornings, and amongst many other, have been using these kinds of standards to test their products, their materials, for decades now. So the standards like ASTM G151 and G155 and ISO 4892, and you can see the titles are shown there, have been successfully used for many, many years to test at the materials level. And here, remember, as I said before, you're asking the question simply, are my materials good enough to be packaged into a solar cell or module? Is this material likely to last 25, 30 years when I put it in this packet? You do that kind of testing at the materials level in a coupon format, more than likely. I would be remiss 
to talk about materials testing and not mention the underwriter's laboratory relative thermal index or the RTI test. I'll touch on that a little bit more later, but it's one of the most called for tests in the US especially, and it's quite controversial. But before I get to that, let me talk about uh, the IEC 61730, which is the PV module safety qualification test. And in the part two section, it calls for the testing of um, PV polymeric materials. Now, one of the controversial aspects of this test method has been on the books for years. And the reason for that is that it has current wording that is shown here that says, if exposed to direct or indirect sunlight in the specified installation orientations, the material shall be resistant to weathering in accordance to ISO 4892-2 or ISO 4892-3. As written, ISO 4892-2 and 3 embodies five different test methods, all of which are intended for different purposes and therefore designed to have different results. They're not interchangeable and so it's really meaningless the way the test method had uh, the specification written. But the good news is that this inadequacy has been acknowledged and I as the uh, head of the weathering group was asked to come up with some wording that would resolve the issue and with an ad hoc group of some other luminaries if you want to call it that. Uh, we came up with some wording that has been submitted and accepted by IEC. This is not really focused on standards, so I won't go into that. If you need some specifics on this, you can contact me afterwards and, and then I will be able to give you that. Or you can stay tuned for the, the standards update in which I will cover this in more detail. Now, I mentioned before the ULRTI, and the purpose of this test is to determine the maximum service temperature for material being considered for module component. And the whole idea is to determine what the maximum temperature of the material that can be withstood uh, for an acceptable period before it starts to show some thermal degradation. Now, the details of the test are shown here, but let me summarize them. This is a one-stress test. It's a thermal exertion test. It, it is a very long test, and even though we don't like to speak about money in these kinds of technical presentations, the controversy about it is because of its length, it's also very expensive, and because it requires the use of reference materials, which are only owned by UL, in effect, only UL can run this test. So it's a one-stress test. Many, many people in the business of um, testing especially long-term degradation testing, question the validity of a one-stress test. The RTI is a one-stress test, it's a thermal stress test. It's long, it can only be done by one entity. Very, very controversial, and especially amongst the Europeans. The, there is, has been some effort in, um, to roll up the RTI testing in the IEC test methods but that is probably not going to happen, and that has been recognized, and there are ways to work around that being discussed right now. I mentioned the IEC, and um, here we look at the IEC uh, PV qualification test. We've gone from the materials testing now to the cell testing, and we're looking at uh, module qualification tests. The IEC 61215 test sequence, or suite of tests, is a, a set of qualification tests that is required for, in this case, crystal, crystalline silicone flat plate PV modules. There is another qualification test for thin films, which is 61646. And uh, as you can see here, the 61215 is a suite of tests, not one single test, but a suite of tests in which different modules are required to undergo. We'll talk more about this as we go through. The big question about these suite of tests is, are they really adequate? Are they suitable for thoroughly testing PV module? One of the most prominent tests in that suite is the so-called damp heat test. And that, <clears throat> that test calls for exposing PV modules to 85 degrees C and 85% relative humidity for 1,000 hours. There are lots of obvious things that are questionable about this test. First of all, it has only two of the stresses. It incorporates only two of the stresses that modules will be subjected to. There's no light in this test. 
and it is well understood that light is a very critical part of testing any material that is going to be subjected to, to sunlight, uh, especially for in such a harsh and direct way and for such a long time. Also, the, the conditions of 85C and 85 relative humidity don't exist and cannot exist together anywhere in the world. So there is a question about the meaning of, of the, the damp heat test. And uh, the best words, to my mind, that I've heard someone say about the damp heat test is that, you know, it's, it's okay to run it. And if you don't pass it, you really probably ought to worry and perhaps go back to the drawing board. However, if you do pass it, you really can't be sure about what it means. So and that's the best I think that can be said about the damp heat test. Um, before I leave the damp heat test and these other series of tests, which I'm not going to go through, they're all listed here for your uh, perusal when you have the opportunity to, to look at them in more detail. But there, recently there has been a um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory workshop and um, along also with the International PVQA Forum. And one of the things we looked at is addressing the obvious inadequacy of the tests that PV materials are required to undergo now. Chief among them the damp P test. So there's a lot of activity and um, I think you're going to have at the end of the day, whenever that occurs, more meaningful tests called out for the long-term durability tests of PV modules. Again, the various tests in the IEC um, protocols relating to the testing of cells and modules. The, I mentioned before the 61646 is for the thin film design and qualification type approval, which is equivalent of the 61215 for the crystalline silicon terrestrial PV module. The 61853, which is a very important test, is at the final stage of balloting and is going to be um, called out for the um, performance and the energy rating of PV modules. So in other words, any PV module that will be marketed will have to uh, have undergone performance energy rating testing. And there are a number of laboratories now gearing up in order to be able to do this test. So the ones on this page that I would call your attention to first and foremost are the last three listed on this page. Let's go back a little bit now and look at the PV qual test as it's called, qualification tests and look at some of the issues that are related to, to that particular suite of tests. First of all, the, the, um, the qual tests, unlike what most people believed in the past, that paradigm is changing quite a bit now, I must say, is not a long-term durability test. The qual tests were meant to look at early life issues, infant mortality issues. They were meant to weed out any poor designs, poor materials very quickly, but they were never intended to look at long-term durability issues as we're showing here. In the classic bath, bathtub curve of product life, the qual tests really are meant only to look at the early life issues. When I first entered this industry, I would frequently hear uh, manufacturers say that they know that their products will last for a long time because they have undergone the IEC 61215 qualification tests. It was generally regarded that these would ensure long-term durability. Now it's accepted that's not the case and the industry, quite frankly, is at a point where it's looking to address that. The qual test is what is called HALT testing, highly accelerated lifetime testing. And here are some of the features of a HALT test that really differentiate it from long-term durability testing. A HALT test does not attempt to simulate the field environment. It only seeks to find design and process flaws by any means possible. That's a perfect description of the IE61215. In, its intent is to determine failure modes, not demonstrate that a product meets specified requirements. It's not meant to determine reliability, but to improve it. The test environments are not directly related to real life and they may be controversial. These are all very, very good descriptions of the IE61215 test. So we've, I think, established or made a case that these are not, the tests that are commonly done are not 
really adequate to address all of the issues facing PV modules. So what do we do? And as I also mentioned, the need to develop true weather durability tests has, is becoming uh, more broadly recognized and this solar ABCs, ABCs by the way stands for America Body for Codes and Standards and it's a DOE initiative to assist with the expediting the commercialization of PV modules and they have seen the lack of long-term durability standards as a barrier to the hasty commercialization. So they've got together and said let's acknowledge this deficiency and let's set forth to uh, address it. Now they don't write standards themselves, the solar ABCs doesn't, but it uh, offers direction to standards writing organizations like those that I've listed here, ASTM, E44 specifically, IEC, certification organizations like TOOF, uh, UL and some of the national labs and well, as well as some of the private companies that said go forth and really develop long-term durability tests but do this in a coordinated way where you're not duplicating effort, you're taking um, different chunks of a very big and daunting pie to work on so that we can have something in a more efficient timeline. So as I mentioned before, the Solar ABC is a, is a DOE project and their objective in this particular instance is to get recommended protocols for accelerated aging tests and to offer a uh, different a scope and objective to the different standard writing organizations. And the three approaches that are listed here. First, you're saying, yes, we do need a qualification test, which would be the minimum amount of testing required to put a product to market. And from that standpoint, it was viewed that the IEC 61215 is adequate for that purpose. We've been using it for years, the industry has been using it for years, it seems to be good enough to weed out any really bad acting modules. So yes, let's call that one uh, sufficient, but at, as a minimum requirement, okay, it's not a long-term durability test, it's a minimum requirement to market in the US. Um, a second higher level of testing, more challenging to the PV module and to the people conducting the test would be uh, test protocols that would facilitate comparative testing. A test protocol that, where you, that you could use to compare the performance of different designs, whether they're your own or your competitors. The third level of testing, the holy grail of testing, would be the accelerated lifetime testing which is capable when used properly to predict the lifetime uh, of a PV module. This obviously would be, uh, be required to, uh, the testing that is done would have to be done at a level that is high enough that would give the user, the people who generate the results, a high level of confidence. The development of these tests are going to require more time, they're going to be more expensive and they're going to need excellent fundamental understanding of the PV module, its failure modes and of models that can be used to determine service life prediction. So really that last and highest level is a very high level of requirements and very, very challenging to accomplish successfully and work has begun on that. Now, um, I, I mentioned before also that the IEC 61215 is working on cleaning up its own house and to do that they have decided that the best approach is to divide the PV materials group into different subgroups in order to tackle very specific slices of a really rather large and convoluted pie. So the task groups that were established are listed here. The steering group, which is the oversight group, there's the edge sealants groups, back sheets group, adhesives groups, uh, partial discharge and then capsules groups. And they're charged, they're using the hazard based approach and charged to first of all determine what, is, what characteristics of their particular material are essential for the successful use in a PV module stack and if those characteristics were to fail and go away, what kind of hazards they would cause to users of a PV module. And then because these uh, characteristics that they have identified 
have to be adhered to when a product is new as well as when a product has been used for 5, 10, 15 years. It was deemed that weathering or the weatherability ought to be a part of each one of the groups listed. Characteristics that are important to a PV module have to be, of course, considered and incorporated when the material is new and they have to be sustained when the material has been aged and weathered. So the weathering aspect becomes important to all of these groups. So uh, I have been asked to hit the weathering group and um, this is an overview. Again, this is not a materials presentation, so uh, sorry, it's not a weathering presentation, so I won't spend too much time on this. I just want to let you know that the weathering group work has been um, segmented in these four parallel groups. I mentioned before that there are a lot of test methods out there that are more than adequate for testing at the materials level. So first thing we did was we did a survey of existing test methods regardless of what industry they came from and uh, sorted them in terms of their utility or suitability for PV modules and we made them available to all of the groups that were listed in the page previously. Now, at the same time, in the green team, there are those in the industry who think it's very important to be able to test the PV materials in a stack. And the, the debate now is whether you want to be able to test an entire module or a mini module. And the consensus seems to be going towards testing of a mini module because it's so difficult to test an entire PV module. But there are lots of issues that must be addressed when looking at testing of a mini module. You have to be able to develop a module as a design that is faithful to the design of a production module. Not just a module, but a production module. So these are some of the issues that are being addressed now in the green team. And um, the purple team is looking at testing of specific modules by themselves in coupon format. Much the same way that most materials are tested today. So from that standpoint, they're going to be looking at the output from the orange team to see if many of those standards can be used. If they can't be used as they exist verbatim, how can they be modified in order to make them more suitable for use for PV materials specifically. So that work is undergoing. <clears throat> the, um, the purple team is looking at the testing of PV modules in their entirety. Recently, that work has been spun off into the International PV Quality Assurance Forum. So that's no longer being dealt with in the IEC TC82 um, polymeric materials group. So that's what's going on in IEC. In ASTM, <clears throat> taking up the challenge from Solar ABCs, this is a, a copy of a page from the report from one of their strategic sessions, strategic planning sessions, and I've pointed to with red arrows the two things that relate to the work that they are looking to undertake based on the IEC, uh, ABC's directive. And number three at the bottom of the page shows accelerated lifetime testing and number five says service life estimation protocols for outdoor durability test protocols. So ASTM has work undergoing as well to address the solar ABC's directing to test um, PV materials and modules. I mentioned before <coughs> the International PV Module Quality Assurance Forum. This is a, a major new uh, initiative that um, is primarily driven by the National Renewable Energy Lab and the uh, Japanese equivalent or roughly equivalent an organization that goes under the acronym AIST and you can see here what the directive or the objective and scope of the International PV Quality, Quality Assurance Program. They would like to, given that there are so many different test protocols now out there in the field looking at the long-term PV or ostensibly looking at the long-term PV durability issue. AIST and NREL would like to incorporate the best features from all the various protocols and combine them into one protocol that can be used by everyone. That is inherently a very, very ambitious task and whether that is to um, be accomplished in a timeline, especially that they've set forth for themselves, remains to be seen. There's ongoing work and if you have any interest in the activities there, the website for this 
effort is shown on the page. I'll leave that up for a second so you can record that if you will. And um, obviously a copy of this presentation will also be available after stock. Very recently, in February of this year, there was a, a National Renewable Energy Workshop. And um, as I mentioned before, the International PV Cure Forum is interested in getting the best features of um, all the um, test protocols that are out there. And this is a, an agenda from the workshop that I've copied and I'm showing here. And each developer or provider of a, um, a PV test protocol was invited to come up and spend five minutes to say what was different, what was unique about their particular protocol and why it ought to be considered for incorporation in an overarching um, test pro protocol. And we had our shot, and I think what's unique and different about our protocol is shown right there in the program. You can see a number of programs were listed under the caption IEC 61215 on steroids, which implies that there were variations of the IEC 61215 theme. Some were extended versions of the 61215 cycles. Some would um, accentuate the 61215 cycles in different ways. Our protocol, the Atlas 25 Plus, was the only one that was listed there as accelerated simulation of weathering. And really and truly that that's, is an accurate statement because we believe that um, a product that spends its entire life in weathering, in the weather, harsh weather, where it is subjected to a simultaneous exposure of the stresses of weather, really ought to be tested in the same way with a simultaneous subjection of the um, humidity, temperature, and solar radiation. So having said that, let's continue on now to um, what we think uh, the design of test program and some of the best practices. And you know, this is still necessary to, to develop your own tests in, in some instances. Even though standards are very important, and as I mentioned before, they provide a universal language to communicate and so forth, but they take an awful long time. Even this international PV QA forum that is supposed to be put on a fast track is really already behind in terms of where it, its timeline that it has set out at the beginning of the effort. So this is why you know we, we say there there's some still some value in going your own way. And even though it is a very, very, very um, challenging experience to undergo uh, the development of test protocols, and it may be a little bit frustrating to try to navigate the very convoluted landscape that I mentioned before, at the end of the day, one still has to test. You can't say, well, all of this is too complicated. I'm not even going to bother. A PV module or a material or a cell manufacturer has to test. And the reason for that is shown here. It, the, the, the rule of thumb is that if you have any sort of a problem, it is obviously best to catch that problem as early in the development process as possible. For every step later than you had an opportunity to catch a problem, that you do catch it, it's going to cost you 10 times more. So if you don't catch a problem, if you have a material problem, for example, that you could have caught in the material testing development stage, and you don't catch it to, until you're testing cells, that will cost you 10 times more. If you catch it at the material level, uh, I'm sorry, at the uh, module level, that's going to cost you a thousand times more, so, and so forth and so forth. So test you must, and you must have a test, um, a sophisticated enough test sequence and uh, test program to, to help you catch issues as early as possible in the development stage. When looking at developing a, an accelerated weather and test program, a few hints that we think are important to guide your thinking are listed here. Obviously, the test must be accelerated. That's the whole point of testing, or one of the points of testing is that you, so that you can get your answers as quickly as possible. It must be realistic. It must correlate to a fairly high degree with the tests or the experience that you would have in an outdoor situation. So therefore, it must incorporate the same stress factors and, fail, and see the same failure modes 
as you would in real life, which is why, as I mentioned before, we thought it was important to have a simulation of Werden for the PV module. It must be relevant. It must produce the same chemical degradation mechanisms that you see in real life. And it must be precise enough to be repeatable and reproducible, obviously. If you're doing a test one year and um, you'd like to be able to relate it's the results you get from this year's modules to the results you get from next year's models. And at the end of the day, it must be comprehensive. It must be able to re reproduce or induce all relevant failure mechanisms. So these are just very simple, maybe logical, but sometimes very awful for custom guidelines to develop in a test program. Some of the, um, the steps that we use right here in Atlas in our consulting department is, are listed here. We uh, develop when we're asked, as we frequently are, by uh, clients to develop a robust and comprehensive program. These are the steps we employ. You develop the scope and objective. What are you trying to do? Um, you use um, a modified FNEA approach. And then we say, all right, it's reasonable to, to, to develop a test protocol that has real stresses, but worst case forms of those real stresses. And then when you go down to step four and five, you develop the test program and you develop pass-fail criteria. You can see here that the arrows go in both directions because there's a little bit of interaction goes, going on between steps two and step three with step four and step five. The, um, you develop, you take a, a best estimate of what a, um, a good test method would be, but you test the test method using FME and so forth, and then you go back to make any modifications that are pointed out by the use of any FMEA. Same with the um, pass-fail criteria. You may, based on your experience and so forth, uh, come up with what ought to be reasonable pass-fail criteria, but your material may actually show that there are different pass or fail criteria that were unanticipated and you may have to go back, therefore, and make some adjustments to your program. And then step six is the implementation of the program itself. And then step seven is um, used in the results of the, the program to make any sort of validation and taking corrective measures where those are indicated. So this is what we saw similar before from the Sandy approach, that test, the test program development and continuation is an ongoing process. A look at um, one company's approach to um, the development of a, a stage reliability assessment process. And this comes courtesy of Dow. Uh, my good friend Ryan Gaston has allowed this to be used. And here they're looking at first developing a qualification test. These are tests that you say, all right, the minimum tests required. And they're using the IEC. They do those qualification tests to make sure that they don't have any issues with their products. And then, um, by the way, you can see at the bottom line here that at the very beginning, uh, allowing for the fact that outdoor tests take a long time, at the very moment that you decide that you're going into a, a long-term reliability test program assessment, start your outdoor tests right away. Those will take long, a long time. You're going to need them anyway, so start them right away. Phase one is where you do the accelerated test, um, test to failure using damp heat, thermal cycle, whatever you have available. Test the materials to failure is what I was doing. And then they're doing some uh, in phase two quantitative predictive accelerated tests. They're using multi-level stress testing, uh, failure distribution parameters, predictive modelings, and, um, and they're coming up with acceleration factors. In phase three, where they're looking at system reliability model, they're using system reliability block diagrams, they're using FMEA and, and fault tree analysis to determine what's causing failures where they do occur. And then in phase four, they're looking to validate the models that they've come up with in phase three. So I have not gone through these in any detail, but again, they'll be here for you to look at. And if you have any questions about how to employ uh, something like this, by all means contact us and we can help you with that. What is a stage, uh, stage gate approach? If you have issues in phase one, 
you know it's right, go back to the drawing board. If you have issues in phase two, then you don't go on to phase um, three unless you've addressed those issues. And by the time you reach phase four, at the end of the day, you have a, a undergone a very robust um, program. So the objectives of this whole type of exercise is to maximize your results while minimizing resource requirements. Capture your your um, whatever problems you have as early in the game as possible. Um, again, another objective is screening and qualification of new materials, designs, and process changes. Quantify impact of reliability to assess risk to the business. These are the objectives that can be met by employing this very um, well laid out stepwise process. Um, you've heard me mention more than once the use of FMEA, failure mode effect and analysis. Failure mode effect and analysis is a very powerful tool that can be used at different stages of the development of a program. Um, always look to utilize that. We're looking to, of course, utilize cumulative damage models and never forget the experience you've gained, uh, whether in your own industry or from other mature industries. The weather in business is not new. It is more robust and has been used more widely in other industries than in the PV module industry. Learn from other industries. And at the end of the day, when you use if the, um, you develop a program, you're never going to be perfect. Accept that, recognize that. And if you have what we call good enough estimates that are defensible by demonstrating the process and the techniques that you've developed, that is probably as good as we can hope for. So the, uh, I mentioned before the, that a filler mode effect analysis can be very helpful because it's a formal process to identify possible failure modes and their effects. You can use it to um, identify possible material-to-material -material interactions, higher level contributions. You can identify environmental and other stresses that may contribute to failure. And you can actually use it, as I indicated before, to identify the appropriate testing methods and portions and aspects of the tests and features of the tests and methods. And when you use FMEA, as I alluded to, you, if you try to go for absolute certainty, you'll be in a process that never ends. Use the, the uh, knowledge that you already have and, and can uh, glean from the literature and glean from other industries. And if you operate on the continuum between certainty and uncertainty, and if you operate more on the certainty end of this uh, spectrum, this is where we think that it's good enough. You are using the knowledge you have from the subject matter, from the um, industry, from the materials, and from everything that you have brought to bear into the experience. And with this, we will we think you can get uh, high enough on this on certain spectrum to help your company mitigate any risk that they may um, be faced with if you don't go through a formal and well-structured process like this. And when you do that, um, uh, by all means, seek out the assistance of experts because, as we say here, um, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. With that um, fairly quick overview, given the subject matter, I hope you have um, seen that the testing along the PV development stage is necessarily very different because different questions are asked at different stages and different tools are used to um, answer the questions that are asked at the different stages. I hope I've given you an, an insight into the questions that are asked and the tools that are used to address those questions. Should you have any um, questions about anything that I have spoken about in this presentation, by all means um, feel free to contact me at the email address that I'm showing on my screen now. 
And with that, I will say thank you very much.